Hi, my name is Angela Skibris and I'm the kinesiologist and a fair bit more than that, although that's who people know me as these days. And I'm extremely privileged and happy. Uh, it warms my heart to be spending the next uh, 50 minutes to an hour, or maybe a bit more, depending on what rabbit holes we end up down, to be chatting with someone who I hold with high esteem uh, and great love in my heart for the roles that they've played and also the roles that they continue to play for not only, on not only myself but many others in support, guidance, someone with an in, incredible amount of wisdom and ability to pull from within the soul of a person, uh, I think, their greater self, their ability to mirror um, and remind someone who they truly are, which is um, much bigger than I think often what we think we are. So thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me, uh, Mr. David Nongchong. I appreciate your time and value it immensely. Thank you for coming on today. My pleasure, Angela, of course, as okay. always. So would you like to just give us a bit of an idea of, um, you know, where you've come and uh, where you're at now in terms of just uh, your experiences in life? Um, obviously, you've had a huge a huge load of experience in direct sales, um, in public speaking, in motivational speaking, one of the most motivational speakers I think I've ever witnessed. Um, yeah, and where has that journey sort of, it's kind of over the years taken you? Well, it's an, it's an, it's an interesting question because, you know, uh, in the early part of my life, I tried... I tried to make jobs and business titles define who I am. Of course, they weren't who I was, but uh, it's a journey that we all go upon. You know, when we, when we're, when we're at school, we're a sixth grader, or we're a first former, or we're a sixth former, or we're a we're a, a first year university student, or we're in my case a, an officer in the army, or uh, you know the managing director of a company, or title, 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 job. So we tend to define ourselves by our our function in society. Mm. And that was my journey. That was the journey I was on. Uh, you know, I came from a, a, a relatively uh, impoverished background. I would say impoverished background. My father went broke in the in the credit squeeze of the 1960s and we went from having money to having none and from uh, having uh, everything I wanted to getting a job as a paper boy so I could buy a hockey stick so I could play in the local hockey game. You know, I mean, uh, a huge, uh, a huge transition for me, you know, building a hard work ethic. So starting out with nothing mm. and, and then leaving home, at 18 years of age, my dad gave me $20 and said, on your way. And I left town. I went to, I went to the big city with 20 bucks. That was it. I had to make my way from there. Um, so that was an interesting journey. I became a commission only salesperson. I earned money by knocking on doors and selling carpet cleaning. Yeah. So I was living by my wits. And uh, it's really funny when you, when you have a job where you only earn money if you produce a result, your thinking changes about what's important. I never made any money by turning up. So I couldn't live by turning up. I had to live by getting a result. That sort of um, cast the, uh, the basis of my, my life from that point on. You live by getting results. You don't live by turning up. I love that you say that because there's a lot of sayings going around these days. It's like, you know what, just, just show up. And I mean, showing up's a part of it because some people don't even show up. So there's it's, that. If you show up, you're a victim of circumstance and the desires of others. If you take responsibility, personal responsibility for your results, you're then in control of your life. That's the difference. And most people don't get that difference. I spend most of my life now talking to people, talking to people about 
taking responsibility for everything that happens to them in their lives. And I mean everything. So my journey, you know, I had the wife, the kids, the nice car, the house, and I was the founding president of the National Speakers Association of Australia, and I was about to head off to America to start my career in America as a speaker, just around the time that uh, Crocodile Dundee was high on the uh, on on the vision of Americans, so I was taking advantage. <laughs> and I got leukemia. Yeah. And I was told, you've got less than five years to live. And my whole world changed. My value system changed. And then I suddenly realised, as I got sicker and sicker and sicker, I suddenly realised that my job title meant nothing. The car I drove meant nothing. The house I lived in meant nothing. The only things that were important to me was the people I love and the legacy I leave. Yeah. So on the leukemia journey, they told me five years. What year was that, David? 1989. 1989. It's a long time past 1989. I think you've stretched that five years out a, a wee bit. So they said five years. And I went, oh, gee, I haven't done everything. Firstly, I've got to secure the future of my family and my children. I started making recordings and giving my children advice for when they grow up because I didn't think I was going to be there for them. Wow. And I started to think about what lessons do I want them to learn? What, it, what gifts can I give them now that they'll carry through their future life so that they have a, they have a good future. And, uh, Really, my whole thinking changed. And in this journey, I went through eight types of chemotherapy. I had 42 blood transfusions. I had four types of radiation therapy. I had four bone marrow transplants. And all of the bone marrow transplants failed. I got to end-stage disease after 11 years of treatment. And in 2001, after I'd had my fourth bone marrow transplant, uh, I was driving home from St. Vincent Hospital in Sydney. And uh, in the journey to heal, I developed this very strong spiritual awareness about me taking responsibility and diving deeply into who I was and talking to God. And I am not a religious person, by the way. I just need to make that. But I'm a very spiritual person. Yeah. So on the last day of, after the day after my last transplant, I drove home from St. Vincent's Hospital. I was driving down Maclay Street, Potts Point, And I stopped just opposite 112 Maclay Street, the Maclay Regis, pulled into my car, stopped in the car. It was, it was a uh, February 2000, uh, in 2000, the year 2000, February 2000. And I'm sat in my car, holding the steering wheel of my car, and I was shaking all over. And, you know, I just swore at the creator. I said, excuse the French, fuck this God. I haven't been through all of this pain now to die now. Mm -hmm. I'm calling back all my energy, all my demand parts, all of my fractured parts of my being. I'm calling them all back to me right now. And I want to be healed right now. It was a lot more passionate than that, the way I said it. Okay. Yeah, and, I can, I can, yeah. And there was a few more swear words. Um, <laughs> yeah. And at the moment I did that, however, my body started to vibrate all over. And I suddenly felt like I had this column of light come through the top of my head, down through my body, all the way down through my spine and into the ground and right to the center of Mother Earth. And it vibrated like a fire hose uh, snaking through my body. And while that was going on, I was heating up all over. And in my mind, I'm saying something's going on here. Yeah. And then I said, well, it could be the drugs, because I was on a lot of strong drugs. 
And I said, oh, no, you know, it's the drugs. You've gone crazy. And I thought, no, maybe it's something. And then suddenly all of these guttural sounds started to come out of the center of my being and out of my mouth, like I was releasing all the negative emotion and all of the, all of the, uh, all of whatever was hot, you know, bad within me was coming out as sound. And I don't know how long this went for. I was just there sort of shaking, holding on to the wheel. And I thought, people are driving by. They're going to look at me and think, that guy's on drugs. And I was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or needs to be. Not, just not the sort that they thought. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know how long this went for. But then it stopped and I went, oh, something might have happened. Or maybe nothing. Maybe it was just my mind. And I drove home. And 54 days later, I had a bone marrow biopsy. And the uh, pathologist, who I knew because I'd been going to them for quite a few years, raced out and said, I can't believe it. We can't find the leukemia. It's gone. And it's never been back. So that was another awakening, right? That, mm. that, that particular moment in time. Now, the journey wasn't over. That was just another beginning point, but it was a point in the journey. And again, this was about value systems have completely changed. Why am I here? What is my job? What yeah. is my role? What am I meant to do? What is my purpose? Yeah. Those were questions. And, you know, it's to wake up, remember who I am, and in the process, inspire others to do the same. Yeah. So I, I became a bit of a teacher. I was always a bit of a teacher. In fact, I've always been a teacher. In fact... From my earliest days, I've been reflecting back to people what they need to see about themselves. I've always intuitively known what people need to see, intuitively. But I realized in my early life, I used to tell them what they needed to see and they would re reject it. And then I realized later I had to draw them to understanding it. So I spent my life doing that. Mm. And... So there was, uh, let me give you this. There are only two reasons why anybody does anything, a good reason and a real reason. Most people tell people their good reason and don't know their real reasons. I knew both. My good reason was to inspire people to reach their full potential. That was my good reason for being. Yeah. My real reason was to understand who I am and awaken the consciousness within me. But I did that by inspiring others in the process because I could, as I opened up a new vista of understanding and learning, I was able to open it up in others. So it's a sort of, and then I realized the teacher is the student. The teacher's always the student. And the students are teachers. They're teaching you. They come to you to learn, but they teach you in the process. So I got very heavily, I, I was always heavily involved in the direct sales industry. My roles changed from sales director to managing director to CEO to founder uh, to consultant to retiree. You know, I, I won some, I lost some. Uh, but I touched a lot of lives and I didn't realize how those touching of those lives worked until years later, people would come back to me and send me a note. I remember one, I got a surprised note from this lady in, in Perth and she just said, I want to thank you. And I thought, for what? And she said, I want to thank you 
or believing in me and my ability to be who I want to be. And five years later, I've started my own business. Five years later, because you believed in me, I started to believe in me. And I thought, aha, the great reward has come. What? Not the money, not, not the consulting yeah. fees, none of that. The reward was hearing her say that she found her place. She found her skill. She found her opportunity and she was taking action. And I, I felt I had a little part to do with it. She felt I had a big part to do with it. But the part was, I saw in her what she didn't see in herself. And that was that she was greater than she believed she was. Mm. If I were to give you uh, a trick, if you like, an understanding, most people underplay their greatness. I look at them and I see what they can be. And I get concerned because they're holding themselves back. They're telling themselves they're no good. They're giving themselves this negative self-talk or they're buying the negative self-talk of the, the negative talk of their peers and their, their social group and their environment and their family and their culture as to, you know, I was born in a poor family and I grew up poor and we've never had the ability to be successful. So we're not. And that's right, because you bought yeah. that story. It's bullshit. It's complete rubbish. And then you get somebody who cracks that shell open and opens up and sees that what they can become. And once you, once you expand a mind, once you learn in language, when you learn a new word, you learn a whole series of concepts that go with that new word. Mm. You can never unlearn it. That's right. Well, it's the same with expanding your your inner knowledge and knowing. And uh, once you learn something, once you once you under once you have an understanding, once you get a piece of enlightenment, once you have an enlightened consciousness, you can't go back. Once you see, uh, once you see the propaganda for being propaganda, you can't unsee it. It's there, it's done, and therefore it never has a hold on you. So the propaganda is what you were taught at school, what you were taught by your peer group, what you were taught by your work environment, what you were taught by your training. All of that's propaganda. That's right. It's somebody else's value that you accept until you change your mind. What you've got to realise is that you're in control of all of it. And if you just turn up, you're the victim. Mm. I'd be interested to to get your feedback on. I know in my work is a is well, I call myself a kinesiologist, but I don't necessarily think that I do. I play the game of kinesiology necessarily, so I just do what I do when I'm in clinic. And I'll give you an example of something that happened last week. That happens a lot, and um, I'd be interested to to hear what you thought about it in light of a conversation we had before we were recording, sadly, <laughs> about consciousness and uh, the awareness of something, whether it be a cell in the body or or actual, uh, you know, life itself, whether it's being observed or not, and whether that changes the way something plays out. So. I had a lady come in about a, uh, two weeks ago now with an eight-month-old baby. And she said, oh, look, I've got concerns about the baby. The baby was small in stature, but not missing any. I said, is she missing any health markers or anything? No, well, no, but the, the you know, medical model is concerned that she's not hungry. And she said, I actually don't think in the whole eight months she's been alive she's ever cried for food. And that's quite unusual. And um, she is a little bit smaller, but she's not unhealthy. She's fine. She just refuses food for the most part. She'll have a very small amount and then refuse. she refuses food. And so where the session ends up going is 
you know, and I'm just using the signposts that I can use within my realm, right? And it goes to genetic. I said, well, this is not hers. It's got nothing to do with her experience. What relationship do you have with food? And she said, oh, I have a terrible relationship with food. My father was literally psychotic and he would, um, it would ramp up at mealtime. And he would place down in front of myself and my brother meals that were far greater than we could eat. So we were set up to fail. And then when we wouldn't eat every scrap on the plate, he would then proceed to abuse his mother, their mother. And the, we'd come to up until nine or ten years old when her, uh, her mother finally decided that wasn't going to happen anymore and they left. Her mother would, when he would turn his back, hide the food in her clothing so that he would think that they'd eaten it and she said it went on to as a teenager when once we moved out with other family members we had family members that were like eat it you know you've got to eat you've got to eat and the whole rule around you don't leave the table until you've eaten every every bite because we all I think we all went through that one as kids like from well, I know in my generation we all did have that one a lot of us and she said, and I might even be hungry, but I would refuse it for the principle that you will not force me to eat. And then it went back to womb time, not her womb time, but the baby's womb time. And she said, well, that's interesting you say that because at the last three or four weeks when it was viable and everything was fine, she could be born. She said, my placenta stopped providing food for her completely. And they had to induce the baby because her placenta stopped providing the nutrition. And she said, and my milk refused to come in. I said, what decision did you make way back when, you know, you finally got out of that programming around what your father was saying around food and being forced to eat? She said, I said to myself, I will never force my child. I'll never be forced and I'll never force my child to eat. But her body, like I'm I'm wondering what you're thinking. So we literally do this. She had the baby sitting on her lap. Now, normally you can imagine there's all these techniques you can do, tweaking and pushing and potting. We did one little set of eye modes, tracking, and the baby what did the eye mode, it blew my mind. Around, I don't even come into what the I know was. Around releasing the belief system of being forced and having a relationship with being forced and food. And I had a text within 24 hours from that mother, and she said, The relationship my child has with food has transformed. She's now hungry, enjoying food, re receptive to food. I don't know what happened. And literally, not much. Like I, little, but considering the conversation we just had around observing, is it possible that the minute she, because she had no conscious connection to any of that information I've just told you. Obviously I guided her to go what happened here and what happened there and we pulled it all together and she said, oh yep. my God, I never saw it like that before. And I said, and she's just doing your program. You will not force me to eat. Well, if we look at if we look at um, quantum physics, mm. okay, you create what you observe, and therefore she was creating what she was observing. Her belief system was creating creating this. You changed her belief system, which changed the creation. So. That's how I would see it. Yeah. Okay. And, and of course, the baby would still thrive. Yeah. Way, because it, as its own conscious being, says, I can, th I can thrive on whatever I've got given. I will adjust. I'll have a smaller body, but it'll thrive on what I get. Yeah. So the baby was fine. Baby was fine. Okay because its consciousness was observing, I'm going to be fine. Mother was putting a restriction. 
Her belief was creating what she was observing. That's how I would put it, because I'm back to this whole thing. You are responsible for everything that you observe. In your world, in your reality, in your creation. And God, I say this to you, and you know, here I am suffering from kidney failure and on dialysis every day from okay. all of the drugs that I took post-transplant and they destroyed my kidneys. And I'm now going, okay, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, so I bought that deal. Mm -hmm. Now I've got to I've got to break through that belief and unbuy that deal because I, I, th that's my only solution. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I meditate on. I'll let you know how it turns out. I look forward to that. Okay. But we actually have to, when anything happens to me, negative or positive, my question is, how am I responsible for creating it? Yeah. Because even when outside circumstances occur to us, what we're responsible for is how we respond to them. So your, your patient was responding to her, her daughter's response to her. Yes. She changes her response. The daughter changes her response. So she's still responsible. That's is that, right. Is that too much? No, it's not. And and I and I tend to go, I look at the magnifying glass, I sort of bring the magnifying glass outward and go, Well, you know, she's a person that comes into my reality and you know, is it so far fetched to think that my belief systems are strong enough to encompass that all of that that we just talked about around her reality. Let me make this simpler for you. Let me make this simpler for you. Angela, do you see yourself as a healer? Yes, I suppose I do. Well, then that's what you are. Yeah. It's no more complicated than what we've just said. You see yourself as a healer. Yeah. So guess what? Yeah. You're a healer. And so my question that bumbles in my head right powerful. now. What we, that's how powerful you are. Yes. By seeing you are a healer, you become a healer. Therefore, people. when people come to you, you see yourself as a healer. If they see you as the healer, Guess what happens? Healing. Mm. This is very powerful. Yeah. You are very powerful. That's that's actually the point I want to get to. You are powerful in your belief of your ability to heal, and therefore it heals. And therefore, it, it's just the application of whatever the topic, whatever the circumstance, whatever the stand is that you have for yourself. What you've got a whole series of skills, and you've got a whole language of kinesiology and healing that you use as an instrument yeah. to empower your healing power. And yet the dichotomy I have within myself in the, light, the later years of my kinesiology practice is I, I, I honestly don't think any of the technique or the processes get, make a damn. No, they don't. It's your application of them that makes the difference. That's the point I'm trying to get to you. The power is within you. That's just the link. Let me give you a different analogy. Mm. You're a musician. Yes. Correct? Correct. Can you read music? Yes. Do you know any people who are musicians who can't read music? Yes. 
and play beautifully? Yes. What's the difference between the two? Well, nothing fundamentally. And something. <laughs> and some things. Yeah. You're just something. a musician who uses music as a guideline yeah. Yeah. to empower your art. Yeah. Somebody who plays music by ear doesn't have your instruments of written music, but they can listen to it and mm. still play the music. Well, it's funny so, because when I learnt my first instrument's flute, and um, we didn't, I grew up in a country town that didn't have, at the time, we did have flute instructors come and go, but they came, they came and went. And so I actually mostly taught myself, obviously I learnt to read music along the way, but I taught myself by listening endlessly to tapes of James Gorwan. There you go. Right. And so I just sat in my room and listen to any song or whatever over and over and worked out what note it was and then learnt it and played it with him. And as time went on, I only knew that I was good when I couldn't hear myself anymore. So. Against come, him. Let's come back to kinesiology. Yeah. All the kinesiology techniques are like written music mm. to help you play the instrument. Mm. You're the instrument. That's just the sheet of music. The instrument, you can play it with the sheet of music or without the sheet of music. Yeah. Still get the result. I'll yeah. come back to the fact. Do you see yourself as a healer? Yes. Then that's what you are. Mm. That's how it works. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. So anyone watching who's like, okay, I wish to become something in my life and it just seems to elude me. <laughs> like, is it is it simply the change of their inner consciousness around who they think they are in relationship to that. Say it's I am abundant or I am. Let me let me give you another whatever. example. What happens with people? People say, "I wish I was rich." Yeah. But deep down inside, they don't believe they're worthy to be rich. Yeah. So no matter, I have a I had a friend. He was on the dole for 20 years. I used to loan him money, which meant give him money because I never got it back, ever. And probably over the years, I loaned him $20,000. Wow. Easy. Okay. But I didn't mind. I could no. afford it. He couldn't. You know, I helped him register cars or insure them or deposits on yeah. you know, rental properties and stuff like that. One day he won the lottery. He won $840,000. Wow. 18 months later, he came to me asking if I'd loaned him the money to buy a car because he was broke. Yeah. And I explained to him, I said, you know, at the time I was earning half a million dollars a year. I said, you know, I earn half a million dollars a year. I pay half of that in tax. I actually pay more than half of that in tax, $296,000 a year in tax. If I save half of what's left over, it'll take me 10 years at least to have the money you earned in the lottery. And you blew it in 18 months. What does that say about his consciousness and responsibility? Yeah. I said, I won't loan you, I won't give you any money because you don't value. I 
would value it differently because I'd see it as 10 years of savings. You just saw it as money to blow. And that's what you did with it. And at the end of 18 months, had nothing of substance to show for the 840000 Nothing. Didn't, didn't nothing. even buy a house. Nothing. People can't hold on to wealth if they don't think they're worthy of it. They are responsible. It'll slip through their fingers. That's why about 80% of the people who win the lottery are broke after 18 months to two years after they win it because they're not, they don't feel they're worthy. Yeah. You know, you've actually got to be worthy internally. Then you can pull the abundance to you. And then the question is, how much is enough? That's right. How much do you really need? See, a lot of people want wealth just to prove to other people that they're worthy. But if you just prove to yourself that you're worthy, then you don't have to prove to other people you're worthy. And when you don't have to prove other people are worthy, the house you live in is the house you love and you're uncomfortable with. The car you drive is the car that makes you feel comfortable and safe. The job title you have is the job title of what you see yourself as. Not how you want other people to see you. Not what other people think of you. Not what your family thinks of you. Not what your peers think of you. But what you think of you. And you want the secret of happiness. That's when you start thinking about who you are and what you are. And you become that. Because I want to let you in on a little secret. You already are what you think you are. And everything around you is a reflection of what you think you are. It's the readout. That's your feedback mechanism. Now, if you can't see it, come see me and I'll show it to you. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I won't argue with that. <laughs> I've seen it. Uh, many, many times, and uh, I'm sure even someone like uh, Kelly Maloney, she would be happy for me to mention her name in this to say that, you know, when I first met Kelly Maloney, you know, just a, a shadow of a human we being. Love Kelly. We do love Kelly, and she loves you. And, uh, and just the other day we were having a chat about how far she's come and, you know, we're we're always bumping up against ourselves from time to time and we've got things to learn and grow and expand and life's just an endless um, endless learning curve. But she just, you know, for me watching from an outsider's point of view, your ability, I think, um, the one thing I'm so grateful about uh, coming into your world the way that we did was seeing the people that I had been you know, walking with for some time, bumping up against themselves, suddenly come into your vortex and see themselves, but like really see themselves. And watching Kelly go from someone who was quite terrified of the thought of speaking publicly or to a group of people or, you know, to on a stage speaking to you know, a huge number of people or on endless uh, Zoom chats or cre their creativity flowing from from somebody and and so I think when we step into the energy of who we really are and like you say like the hats that we put on like oh I'm a this or I work as a that or I drive this they're all just you know trinkets in and around our vortex but who we really are inside of that when that shines through it's just so inspiring and that's not to say that every single person is here to be a mirror, that someone else has got a very different energy of why they're here. And and what you have is very unique. And I know we dipped in very briefly yesterday about some of the, the some of you out there may have heard of the Mayan calendar and the signatures. It's very fascinating to go and look at that. I felt like I met myself for the first time many years ago and I, I learnt who I was in that. And that's just one way of looking at myself, I guess, and understanding myself. It's not all there is. 
But it helped me to see as, as someone who is white wind and, and um, or spirit guided by the white mirror, which is uh, the sort of truth, but also the ability to reflect back. And I thought, well, that's why often I can be good in clinic too, because people walk out going, oh, wow, I see myself again and, and in that mirror. So when we're really uh, on fire within ourselves, people tend to walk out seeing themselves, not me. They don't walk out feeling I want to, they want to be like me. They walk out knowing they want to be like them. And knowing that you are literally the white mirror and guided by the white mirror means that wherever you go, uh, people are seeing themselves and that may be what they don't want to hear. <laughs> Some people don't like them because of it. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the mirror image is going to just go boom. And because you are the white mirror and you're guided by the white mirror, there is no escaping that people are, if what they see reflected back from you is something that irritates them. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, it does. But you know what? Uh, the greatest <laughs> gift, the greatest gift we can give anybody. Yeah is to see their true potential yeah. and believe in them when they don't believe in themselves. That's right. And that goes for people and their children. When you believe in your children, when they don't believe in themselves, mm. all sorts of magic happens. When you believe in your peers, when they don't believe in yourself, when you believe in your coworkers, Mm. Let me explain something about what happened to me in corporate life. Mm -hmm. When I first started out as the boss, you know, when I was the general manager or the managing director, I had all this secret knowledge and I used to keep it to myself because that mm. was my power. My power was my secret knowledge. I understood things other people didn't understand. Then I got leukemia. And it looked like I was going to die. And I got this awakening that I need to share my knowledge to leave a legacy. And then I started to teach everybody what I knew, all my secret knowledge. And a miracle happened. My jobs got bigger. I got better teams. Some people left with my secret knowledge and went and did other stuff with it, but I became more effective. Yeah. My teams became more loyal. I got better jobs. I earned more money. Holding back my secret knowledge was the worst thing I could have ever done. The best thing I did was training, inspiring, and motivating my successes and constantly looking for successes. That's what I did. And when I did that, my whole corporate life changed. Mm. Now think about that in the context of life. Well, it's like, I think it straight away ignites in me this whole concept of like people love to be seen. If I hear one thing that people come endlessly come into clinic and like, I just don't feel seen and I don't feel heard. I don't feel seen and I don't feel heard or appreciated or whatever. But those two, I don't feel seen and I don't feel heard. And I think if I if I look at that from a macrocosm, it's like as soon as somebody feels seen, then they expand and I don't even know. I don't even know how to quite put my words on this, but it comes back to that science we were talking about earlier about quantum stuff. You know, what because you, you were what seeing you them, yeah. So, so were you affecting them, or were they affecting you? Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's this is the keys. It doesn't matter. What matters is they're in your area of influence. If they've come to you, yeah, you attracted them. Yeah. So, what was the reason you attracted them? You attracted them. Mm. Now, if you are criticizing them, always telling them what they do wrong, what they're bad at, then that's a reflection of you as well. Yeah. And if they react negatively to you or they produce bad results as a result of your criticism, 
then you, you're responsible for that. So when does, does that mean you should never say anything to somebody who does something bad? No, no, not at all. It doesn't mean that. But our job in life is to celebrate all of the things that people are good at and lift them up and believe in their ability. Now, can we tell them how to improve? Yes. We can tell we can we show them how to do things better? Yes. But not as a criticism. No. But as a learning and a teaching. It's it's all about how you approach it. You know, if you say, you know, little Johnny, you can never do anything right. Johnny will think you can never do anything right. You program That's right. That's right. But you could say, Johnny, you did that well, but let me show you how you could do it even better next time. Yeah, yeah. People don't feel attacked or belittled. Or... Then he's not attacked. He's enlightened. He's in... yeah. So mm. you're, you are responsible for how you react to others. If you react with lovers, to others with love and forgiveness, these are the two key words, love and forgiveness, what are you forgiving them for? Disappointing you, doing it wrong, being an idiot, da-da-da, whatever. That's the forgiving. Love is seeing the, their potential, seeing what they did right, seeing how they can improve. That's the love. Because everybody's got this television screen in the centre of their forehead that only the person you're talking to can see. And it transmits true intent. We'd call it the third eye. It's a transmitter and a receiver. Mm. And it's transmitting your true intent. You know, I talked about two reasons why anybody does anything, the good reason and the real reason. Well, it only transmits the real reason. And if your belief system is negative, if your belief system is depressed, that's what you'll transmit. If you uh, transmit illness and defeat, that's what you'll transmit. That's what, well, you know, you'll attract those people around you. Mm. You know, people say, why am I always attracting these idiots? Hello? <laughs> Mm. But other people say, oh, I'm surrounded by lovely people. I can't believe it. They're just so lovely. Why? Hello? You know, you are control of the <laughs> transmitter. We call it the law of attraction. Mm. You've got to change the station. You, you know, you can program it. You can use affirmation, self-talk, writing. All of these things are programming opportunities. Or your kinesiology, kinesiology skills are programming tools. Mm -hmm. They're all tools of programming. Mm -hmm. How you live your life is programming. It's an affirmation. What you speak is an affirmation on a daily basis. What So you can script your affirmations, speak them, and have them become part of your being. And then that'll become part of your reality. Mm. If your affirmation is, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, you'll never be worthy, you'll never be good enough. Why? Because that's what, you, that's what you're speaking. And if you're telling other people that, that's how they'll be responding to you. Mm. If you're critical of them, they become critical of you. You go, why am I surrounded by all this criticism? Hello? Uh, you know, invariably, I, I try to boil this, all of this stuff down to very simple things because fundamentally they're very simple. Mm. And who, who we are usually screams out so loudly we can't hear what people are speaking. Oh, 
when 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 you see a, a Karen, you know the you know the <laughs> need to speak to the manager. Uh, Sorry to all the Karens out there. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, the I think yeah. where is their pain? Yes. You know what I see is their pain. I think, oh, they need a hug. Oh, the poor bugger. They need some love. Yeah. That's what I see. When I see people acting out, you know, sometimes I think, oh, they have so much pain. You know, when they're angry, and you think, oh, that poor damaged soul. Now, sometimes we can't fix that. So I walk away because I don't want to engage in that. I, I don't want that energy around me. No. But the funny thing is I don't want that energy around me. I, I rarely attract it. I rarely observe it. It's not in my reality. And that's back to the quantum physics, you know. Mm. You experience what you observe. You observe what you experience. Mm. Am I going around in circles here? No, you're not. But it, it is a it's a cyclic. Um, com it's a conversation that does that and continues to. Uh, it does. I think I think about the. Um, oh, the word just has dropped out of my my head. The, if I remember the first day I met you on a Zoom call, interestingly, uh, and the first thing I saw on the screen was not a mandala, the... Oh, the, oh, 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 the, uh, the, the Mendelbrot. The Mendelbrot. Hmm. The fundamental and, shape of the universe. Right. Hmm. And I knew whatever game you were up to at the time that I would be a part of that game, like a big flag. <coughs> so, but it's, I think about the mental brot when you when you speak like that, or when we have any of these conversations, because just when you think you know, and it comes around and you go, there's oh. another layer of the onion skin. That's Followed right. Another layer of the onion skin. That's what our journey on this planet is about: peeling off the onion layers to see what's below. Mm. That always reveals something below that. Mm. So as you go in, when you meditate and you go in and you're touching an emotion, when you experience that motion, emotion, there's another emotion underneath it. And when you experience that one, you find another one underneath that. That's how you open it up. Mm. So if you're fearful, you go into the fear. If you deny the fear, it will keep coming up and hitting you in the face until you go into it. Yeah. And life will keep showing up in that whole concept of what you resist persists in your reality. Um, the more that you resist it, the more it persists. And um, I see that a lot. I recently had a, um, I have a client actually who had a um, long standing client, a long, long time we've been working together. And that's where this Mandelbrot idea or the onion skin, some people might think, oh, well, you mustn't be a very good kinesiologist if you've been seeing someone for 10 years. But I'm not seeing her because there's something wrong. Now you're peeling because off the layers. We're peeling off the layers. And, and there are people that come and we do the work and we get the result and you might only see them one or two times. And that's fine. But there are some people who just get, they want to keep peeling away at, at the layers of consciousness. And awareness and becoming uh, lighter and lighter with every session and every new awareness or aha moment that you walk out with just um, maybe a couple of thousand more bits, you know, because we only perceive so many bits and yet there are millions of bits of information that are coming through our consciousness in, in one piece of, um, and we're only going to perceive the bits that, that the, our particular subconscious program believes to be true. So there could be all these other bits like you're talking about perceiving life like this and it's wonderful, it's abundant, and yet that's not been my experience. So my consciousness doesn't pick up any of those bits. It just picks up the bits where maybe, oh, wow, that looks dangerous over there or how do I, whatever. And so this lady's been coming and, and her niece has a brain tumour. And um, so we've been doing with her permission we've done work with the niece via zoom 
and uh, she's recently been unwell and had a lot of had a lot of swelling. And she gave us from her hospital bid the bit the, the can we dive into this a bit and have a look at maybe what's going on? She said that's fine. This may be a little bit out there for some people, but <laughs> that's what we did. Anyhow, um, and it might this may sound oh well, of course that would come up, but we went down into what was happening and the primordial fear of death came up. And in none of the sessions had we talked about that with this particular young woman. Uh, but it came up and we went down under the layers of, you know, what was going on around this prim primordial fear of death and um, and our existence and whatever. And we, we did some work on it. And anyway, we hadn't talked again for two weeks. And yesterday I heard from my friend the, and she said, oh, you won't believe it. Uh, someone else who was with her niece because she's not with her niece currently she's on a boat in turkey somewhere mm. how rude can i just say <laughs> but anyway she said oh my other niece has called me to say that she's been with with um the one with the brain tumor and she said they were just lying together on the bed just being together not talking about anything at, at all just lying there and she said and out of the blue the lady with the brain tumor turned and said, you know, I don't know why, but I'm not afraid to die anymore. Just out of nowhere. And of course, she relayed that because then this other person comes back. She goes, that's what we just worked on, this whole thing going on. And all of her swelling is coming down and she's feeling a lot better. And so who knows? I mean, I know that the end game doesn't necessarily mean that someone lives. My own father taught me that harsh reality <laughs> well, but that's that's a different issue the yeah. fear of death is once you take away the fear of death then about it's the joy of experience of living yes you see a lot of people do things based on their fear of death and i had to face that fear of death yeah i was in the icu on a respirator twice yeah when each time I went unconscious, I wasn't sure I was going to wake up. And each time I woke up, I thought, I'm still here. I remember I was in, I'm in the intensive care unit and I'm looking at the, the nurse and she never left. And in one of my conscious awaking moments, I said, am I in trouble? <laughs> and she says, yes, you are in trouble. <laughs> you know. And I thought, I'm not fearful. Yeah. I'm aware. And uh, so once you stop being fearful of death, then it's about being embracing life, however long it's going to be, and what lessons do I learn? But I, I also feel that we don't actually die anyhow. No, that's right. Continue on, and so that's it's just another stage and another phase of, of, yeah. of our existence. I mean, I know it's I don't know maybe for some people it's like a, a lightning bolt moment, but do you remember whether there was a lightning bolt moment where that fear of I mean, having faced your own mortality strongly like that, and I guess like, do you remember a moment when that fear of death left no it was slow it was because i was living with leukemia and i had a deathly terminal disease my doctors had no curative approach when i was first diagnosed yeah you know and uh and i was young for the type of leukemia i had it was normally older people got it and i got oh. it when i was 39 so um, and so I started doing a lot of spiritual work as part of my healing regime and peeling out my peeling my onion skin layers. Lots and lots and lots of them. I used a lot of sound therapy to release emotions and you know cleansing and all sorts of things. So I think I lost the fear in that process, little mm -hmm. bit by little bit. 
but it was the realization I lost the fear at that moment in 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 the ICU. Mm. You know, when I was in serious trouble and I thought, well, I'm not afraid. I'm just going to live each moment. Yeah. And that's how I got through all of the pain of all of the various treatments and stuff that happened to me was I lived each moment. And do you know what I do today? What? I live each moment. Yeah. Even today, I'm living each moment. I'm celebrating each moment. I'm grateful for each moment. Mm. I still see myself and my purpose, and I find new ways to achieve it mm. each day. So what we're doing on this call is part of that purpose, to yeah. inspire others to live their lives, to take responsibility for whatever is happening to themselves, to see themselves as what they truly are to see that they have far greater potential and they're so much more powerful than they probably believe. Yeah. And this is not ego stuff. No. It's different. You know, that can trip you up. But uh, And there's nothing wrong with having a healthy ego, by the way. No, that's right. As long as it's not harming and hurting others. Do you find now that... Well, the terminology, I don't even like to use it, but the terminology is like at the moment the kidneys are acting in a certain way in your body um, and requires dialysis, right, to continue to cleanse the body. Hmm. I send light yeah. to them. Each, each day when I meditate, I send light and rejuvenating energy. To them. Okay, so I'd like to think that they are rejuvenating, maybe slowly, but it took 20 years for them to get unwell. Unwell. Yeah. So my question is, like, I mean, obviously, well, you answered that in a way that, like, your focus each day is on sending them um, the energy and the intent and, I guess, continuing to shift your own reality so that that shifts, so that the possibility of, that they heal is, po well, is possible. Whether, whether it happens from somebody bringing me a bionic kidney or whether there is a miracle healing approach that happens outside of me, yeah, I'm accepting all of that as well. I'm, That's right. You know, there's no, you know, but there's an intent in me that I will be well. Yes. And so if you look at me today, most people don't know that I'm unwell. No, no, you look very well. Um, most people don't believe I'm sick, you know, at yeah. all. And you know what? I'm not sick. Yeah. Do you ever find that your mind, because like every time you get to that point where you have to have dialysis, well, I'm going to say have to, that's just the only word I can think, you have to have dialysis that you start to, to feel like, on a daily basis, you're facing your like a tiny part of your mortality, like or that's past. No. Yeah. No, it's living with a condition. It's like brushing your teeth. Yes, it's like but for someone who's had a thyroid. Without, if you live life without brushing your teeth, you'll have bad breath in the and that your teeth will fall out of your head, and mm -hmm. you're responsible for that. Or you could brush your teeth every day, twice a day, better. Three times a day, even better. That's what you could do. You, you're in control. Well, I have to wash my blood. Yeah. It's called dialysis. It's peritoneal dialysis, so it happens in a particular way. But I need to do that every day. That's fine. It's like brushing my teeth. Yeah. I just do it every day. And, you know, I live a normal relatively speaking, normal life. I mean, there's some restrictions on travel and things like that, but that doesn't bother me because I've traveled the world. I've, you know, I've lived and worked in 11 countries. It's not like I've deprived. No. I'm grateful. You know, I'm yeah. surrounded by, uh, by gratitude and love. I'm surrounded by gratitude and love. So because, because of that, I have a really nice life. Yeah. But I, I don't, I actually, uh, uh, think about know, it. No, I mean, when, even when I go and see my doctor, listen, I go and see my doctor on a regular basis, once a month, for full checkup. 
Hello, I bounce in there. Yours looks so well. You know, and that's because I am well. Yeah. I just brush my teeth every day, if you get the analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't go, oh, God, I'm sick, because I'm not a victim. You know, there are some people out there, they're victims of their disease yeah. or their dysfunction or they're, you know, they're missing a leg or an arm or a tooth or an eye, you know, or a soul. I'm sorry, but, you know, some people are missing souls. It's true. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, they're missing something and then that's their reason for the life being terrible for them. And so that well, becomes their reality, Angela. Well, what occurs to me right now, actually, is maybe we're living in the miracle. Well, we are living in the miracle because, guess what? My father's father, who was a farmer in Nigara, um, he died of renal failure. And why? There was, there was no dialysis. Yeah. There you go. He just brought in the last... Dad knew about a week before he was going to die that he was going to die because he walked out of the wheat field and said, boy, you're going to have to finish this one. And that was it. And two or three days later, he died. Literally, he pulled wheat off and took two or three days before he died. But he It's miraculous that we have the technology the way we do now that. I do it at home. I don't go to hospital. You know? It's amazing. There it is. And I have a machine at my daughter's place in Sydney. So if I want to go to Sydney, I just plug in there. Wow. All good. Done. And that's, a, that's miraculous. I mean, some people, I do know um, an Aboriginal elder who goes once every three days and he has to go into the hospital and it's quite a big deal. Yeah, it's a deal. It's a big deal. If you yeah. do hemodialysis, I mean, you basically it's five, it's four to five hours, three times a week. And yeah. You've got to travel to the hospital, travel back That's from the right. hospital, and it wears you out in the process. So you need a day to recover. That's it, right. And I've been through that, so I know what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, these are all. I have this famous saying: they're minor inconveniences. Okay, and I wrote a book called Leukemia, A Minor Inconvenience. I'm because, hoping there'll be a second edition. <laughs> <laughs> because, because that's, it's how you approach it. You know, you know, you could lose your leg in a car accident and that could be, oh God, I've lost my leg. Or I live with a, a leg missing, you know. You meet people who've got no arms and no legs and they still are amazing. Or people who, you know, who've lost their little finger and think that's the reason they can't work for the rest of their lives. This is yeah. all about how you think and your consciousness level and taking personal responsibility for your life. You know, when we take personal responsibility for the life we live now, you can be grateful for everything that you've got. And, you know, if you've got a, a roof over your head and food on the table and people who love you, you're one of the richest people in the world. That's right. And chained in your pocket. You know, when I worked in Indonesia, there were 10 million people living on the streets of Jakarta who lived on less than 40 US cents a day. They lived on the edge of open sewers and they lived on one cup of rice and a cob of corn for a whole day. And they worked for a whole day to be able to buy that. And if you got sick, you died. That's poverty. Anything above that is enormous wealth. If you were those people and they saw how the homeless live in Australia, they'd think that they were rich. It's all perception. That's right. You know, people go out and take drugs to drown their perceptions. 
How horrific is that? Sad. Well, but if we're going to have a new world, if we're going to, if we're actually going to ascend to this new world that we're going to go to, we've got to lift our consciousness up. We've got to lift our vibration up. We've got to lift our being up. And we've got to take personal responsibility for the life we have now. And we've got to start choosing who we associate with, how we think, what we read, what we eat, what we watch, what we speak. All of those things impact our vibration and our consciousness. If you lift your consciousness, you'll live in a new world. Literally. Literally. So, you know, my job these days to is, is fundamentally to inspire people to raise their consciousness, to become enlightened, and to build a community of enlightened spirits who are there for each other with love and forgiveness, not with criticism, not with one-upmanship, not with ego. You know, if we could all uh, telepathically communicate today without any filters, in other words, we always saw your true intent, what's in your heart, we would only have communities of like attracting and living with each other. Desperados, thieves, thieves uh, and manipulators, they'd all live with each other. Why? Because that's what they'd see and that which they'd be attracted to. And their skills and intent would not work on people of pure heart because it would be seen. You know? And when somebody can't deceive you, then you would speak to them in truth. And when you speak to people in truth, they'd see that you, like them, want love and forgiveness in your heart because that's what most people want. That's right. We use all of these sophisticated filters in front of us to protect ourselves the fear that we'll be damaged if we show people our true, our true being. But our true being is a loving light for most. There are some negative beings out there where their, their heart is black and we need to avoid them. Mm. Don't think that they aren't there. They're there. Yeah, they are. Okay. They are there. I'm going to tell you a little story. Okay. Uh, when I was in St. Vincent's Hospital after a certain event I had, and I, I was in a ward with another transplant patient. His name was Glenn Williams. He's passed now, so I can use his name. Uh, Glenn was in the bed next to me. And while I was, uh, I was in there, I, I was on morphine, I was on drugs, you know, wasn't well. Uh, he had a a uh, uh, you know the blue curtains I call them of silence around his 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 bed with a big sign that said do not disturb. And while I was in there, two doctors came in to see him, to tell him that there was no more they could do for him, and he was going to die within the next two weeks. That was the news they gave him, and he was one of Doctor Victor Chang's original heart transplant patients, but. He'd lived for 16 years with his new heart, but now everything could start to fall apart and he was on his last legs. Um, these doctors came in and told him and then left him. And he was sitting behind these blue curtains, sobbing. Just miserable. And even though I was in a a drugged state, I felt compelled to go and talk to him. So I got out of my bed with my uh, uh, <laughs> <Dripping>. <laughs> thing, <laughs> wheeled myself over 
And I said, do you mind if I sit with you? Or would you like me to sit with you? And he said, yes, please. And so I held his hand and I said, well, tell me about your life. And he started to tell me his regrets. I said, no, no, don't tell me about your regrets. Tell me about the things you love in your life. And and he sort of said, oh, like, you know, I love waking up. He lived in the in the Blue Mountains. He said, I love waking up on cold mornings, snuggled under my doona, my mum bringing me a hot cup of tea. And, you know, stuff like that. And we just talked about that. And uh, and And I talked to him about his journey because he was he was going over to St. Vincent's Hospice. And I just said, you know, I just wanted to be here for you. But while I was doing that, I noticed something. I noticed this dark energy that left his arm and jumped onto my arm and attached to my being. And I was too unwell to get rid of it at the time. And I could feel it attached to me. It had been attached to him for a long time. It was sucking off his dying energy. But it knew he was dying and it jumped onto me. And I went home and I spoke to a spiritual healer, a friend of mine, and said, how do I get rid of this thing? And they said, well, why don't you go to one of the elements in your backyard, one of the rocks, and ask them if they'll accept that entity. So I did that. And the elements in the rock said, yes, we'll accept it. So I cast it out and I saw it out of my arm and go into the rock. Then I started to heal. Now, you might not believe that that's true. I do I believe it's true. You, that's true. And we've got to be careful. We've yeah. got to keep our bodies clean and clear. We've got to surround ourselves in white protective light. We've got to wash ourselves constantly and make sure that these entities do not attach themselves to us because they can and do. Would you like to hear my story? Yes, please. So this is many years ago. Early days for me um, when this was not like I went out of my way to have this experience. It just happened. So I had a very, very loyal long-term client who um, – worked in child protection and not that she would go into obviously she couldn't go into detail of things but she would need weekly support because part of her role was removing children from extremely abusive heartbreaking situations from you know all ages and I remember her coming to me one night we lived in North Richmond at the time and um, at the time I had this brown covered with books on it and I'd bought in a really large glass I had these green glasses that were really thick and they were big and I bought this glass of water in for her and set it on the bookcase and she's on the massage table and we got to talking about a particular client that she had who was probably pre-teens and she said oh, oh I'm just blown away I'm just kind of unnerved by this particular situation. I said, oh, well, what happened? She said, oh, I went to visit them. They're in a psych hospital. And uh, she had had her thoughts about it for a little while that it was not just he was unwell and abused, but it was more than that, something similar to what you just described. Uh, but how do you prove that? And it was just her thoughts. She said, I've just visited them in a hospital and his voice changed while he was in the bed as a child to become a man's voice. And he, the reason why he was in there was because he was, you know, wanting to harm people. And anyhow, um, I said, oh, gosh, it's, you know, I dare you'd say the word, some type of um, entity possession. or possession, right? And it's, this was not my world. It's not like I went out of my way to go, I bet it's this. It's just what where we start. And she was a very professional, not uber spiritual person. Very high edu highly educated woman, probably in her 60s at the time. She was no, didn't take fools easily. You know, she was a very educated woman. 
And she said, I truly believe that, Angela. And I said, and I felt a shift in it. It was like it became icy cold in the room. And I said to her, your muscle testing is just off. What is going on? I said, I don't feel like I'm muscle testing you anymore. Like this was my first experience of this. Some people might find it outside their realm of normal, but I said, something's not right with your muscle testing. And I just intuitively said, who's here? And are you related to this person, this young person? And the glass behind us, we just heard, we just heard pop, right? And water dripped down my bookcase, a whole large glass of water dripped down the bookcase. And you could hear this buzzing in the room. And wow. we were wet in our pants, I can tell you right now. And I'm not religious either, but I can tell you right now, I started to try and recite the Lord's Prayer. I can tell you, and I couldn't get it out of my mouth. I couldn't even open my mouth to say certain words in that prayer. We got through it and I just called in all the, the you know, loving, light-filled assistance that we could and basically requested that this thing leave this person. It's all right. Go no right ahead. And um, anyway, everything settled down. The, the energy in the room settled down. I mean, we were... It was, you can't describe what it felt like in that room at the time. And we're both thinking, I mean, you can't believe that it could be a coincidence that just as we go, who is it? Who's in the room? Who, what's going on here and next in the glass? So I went and picked up the, I have a glass here and where it connects, you know, you've got this large part in the bottom that connects to the glass. When I went and picked up the glass, imagine that glass was butter. And I had a knife, a really hot knife, and I just went through the bottom of the glass like that. Wow. That glass was sliced, not one edge. It was just separate from its base. And it wow. was not a, it was a big, heavy glass. And that kid was destined for a mental hospital for the rest of his life. No doubt in my mind. And within, 18 months, I think he went in, he, he was just early teens at that stage, but I think by the time, um, I reckon within two weeks, he was off his medication. And that child, the last I heard, I, I'm not in contact with that lady anymore at the moment, but the last I heard is he went on to live a normal life, went to university. That thing, the next time she saw him was gone. He was like a completely different kid. And that doesn't happen very often, but that was what taught me that there are a lot of people that that's happening to them. Yes. And it's their pain and their anguish. And obviously that guy who, if he was really down and crying all the time and like they they just feed off that. Exactly right. So you've got... You, you, you've got to be aware. You've got to be conscious of that. You know, hanging around a community of like-minded, enlightened mm. people will help protect you. Mm. You're going to find that I'm having a conversation with a really fun, well, he's not always, he's fun, but his name's Jerry. He's a, uh, I think he's a psychiatrist. I'll have to double check his um, qualifications, but. 30 odd, 40 years in psychiatric hospitals and jails with psychiatric um, criminals. And his experiences like that, he's chatting with me at the end of July about his experiences. You'll really find him back. He's amazing. Yeah. Now, really cool. Angela, we have been we on must... for two hours. <laughs> I think so I'm going to answer some of my phone calls. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. That that was the quickest two hours I've ever had, I think. Thank you so, so much for coming on. And I feel pretty confidently that there's going to be people, uh, you know, crying out for more. So I hope we can connect again sometime soon. Okay. And dive into some new rabbit holes. But thank you again for your time.
and Pleasure. look forward to connecting with you again soon. See you again. Thank you. Take care. Bye.